Hey everyone, I'm Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. Why am I smiling? Because I just recorded the coolest episode with Amos Mary, who's the founder and CEO of Colored Coins. In case you've been living under a rock, Kolu and Colored Coins have been around since the early days of 2000, like 2012. They um, were related to MasterCoin, Counterparty, all those early second layers, Bitcoin like 2.0s that people talked about and experimented on. Funny fact, Vitalik Buterin, before writing the white paper for Ethereum, actually wrote the white paper for something called Bitcoin X that was colored coins back in 2013. So cool. So much history, stories, and knowledge that I got from this episode. I can't wait to present it to you guys. I'm Charlie Sherman. I'll talk to you guys right in a minute. I'm here today with Amos Mary. Amos, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me. Very happy so, to be here. Yeah, it's funny because it always happens. Like I'll get a guest on the show and it's like a green room type of thing. And we talk for a few minutes, but it, what ends up happening is I'm like, wait, let me just hit the record button because we the small talk <laughs> is what people want to hear on the show. Yeah, right. We, we were we were introduced around six years ago. Um, I can't believe, I just can't believe. Like you know, I read these emails. I was re just, I'm reading an email now that uh, when we were introduced by by Aaron Conan, you mentioned earlier, and it's like I write emails differently now than I did before. I care about grammar more. <laughs> what about you? Do you notice <laughs> things like? Do you ever read e old emails like from ten years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I mean, I, you know, I remember I was, um, I was actually, um, I went, I was living in Cyprus. We'll talk about it uh, soon, of course, uh, with financial crisis and all of that back then. But anyway, uh, I remember like going out of surfing and seeing that, you know, you answered the email, uh, for, uh, oh, yeah, I'm looking maybe, at it now. for maybe investing in, um, uh, I think we called it in the beginning, join my IPO or coin powers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that was really, I was so happy. I remember to see that. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool because it's nice to see something like colored coins that's been around for so long that morphed into Kolu, uh, continue to be around today. Um, and like you, you, but you took a very different spin on it. You, you, you decided to go for like a hyper local, um, model instead of like building out a, a token for the whole world. Oh yeah, so that was um, well, very very long story. Um, so when we um, um, kind of like started with the idea of colored coins, I remember I was working for Etoro, uh, yeah, on the exchange. So I was managing all of the trading dealing desk over there, and I was living in Cyprus. Um, so many companies have 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 come out of people who worked for eToro. eToro is one of those companies that like everyone worked for in the, in the yeah, early days. It, it, it's all because of uh, Yoni Asia, the CEO. He's very super very visionary. Yeah. So he like, uh, I remember like 2011, he sent an email to all the employees in the company. Back then, I think we were 80 or something like that. Today, I think it's a thousand people or something like that. So we were like 80 people and he sent an email. Hey, listen, there is this coin People are talking about it. I don't know if it's you know a, a game or something is going to happen with it, but I think all of you should read about. It. And, oh, you know, that's so cool! Uh, and now being a CEO, I know that most of the employees usually don't read your emails, <laughs> but I I actually, <laughs> but I actually did, um, and I was I remember I was fascinated um, and um, looking at you know my background is in trading. Um, and, um, um, for me, it was like a convergence of a lot of things that I saw in finance. I, so wanna... I got in. Yeah. Yeah. For... No, you got in. Sorry. No, no. I uh, just said I got into, you know, uh, deep into the rabbit hole and I just uh, couldn't get out once. Okay. You know, that's a perfect place for you to, to pause because that's what I was going to, going to ask you. Now I hate when I interrupt people, but now I know what's, what's going on. Um, so, you, so you're hearing about Bitcoin for the first time, and these are very early years, like 2012 maybe or whatever, 20, you know, um, so early. In those years, no one was talking about um, really putting, like having multiple layers on Bitcoin blockchain. First of all, no one was using the word blockchain. There's like Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, Bitcoin 2.0. Yeah, 2 .0. Bitcoin 2.0, 2 2.0, 2 which, yeah. which isn't a, a negative thing. And it really wasn't until like Ethereum that was taken seriously. I that that was like seen as like, let's put it on a separate blockchain. Cause you remember that Vitalik originally wanted to put um, 
Ethereum on top of, of the Bitcoin blockchain. Why? Yeah. This, this is a question that I have for you. Why was colored coins uh, uh, seen more of like a complementary and still today, you know, on top of Bitcoin blockchain? But back then when everything was going to be built back on the going to be built on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, some things like Ethereum or whatever got a much uh, worse rap than colored coins uh, or Kolu. Why, why is that? So, um, so when we started, basically, um, there were a few developers working on on the initial protocol. Uh, the first group we called it Bitcoin X. You can still uh, see oh, the remember, Google yeah. uh, uh, the Google um, group, which you have all the history, which is crazy because you see Ripple being built out of this group. Uh, you know, counterparty like all of those Mastercoin, all of those protocol out of this group. So in the beginning, there was um, Alex uh, Mizrahi, who is um, he's one of um, I think the best and, and most unappreciated developers in the community, maybe he's, wow. he's not really known, but he's, he's like one of the first, uh, seriously. So anyway, um, and then we, we found Vitalik, um, um, Yoni and me on uh, Bitcoin talk. Um, I think it was 16 years old or something like that. And we, we paid him from Itoro 80 Bitcoins, I think, to write the white paper for colored coins. Wait a um, minute. Vitalik was the originally wrote the white paper for colored coins. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Didn't, That's didn't, crazy. Uh, I don't think anyone yeah. knows that. <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, so he wrote that. Um, we had lo lots of meetings. What year we was that? Together. 2012, end of 2012. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we started work on that. And I remember, you know, Vitalik was just too smart for me. <laughs> I guess he was, I got to get a copy know, of that colored coins. I'll try and get it to you. I'm going to, um, I'm Googling it now as you're talking. Um, anyway, so I guess, you know, he was, he was just too smart for me. It was uh, 16 or 17 years old. and was just talking, you know, things that I was like, what, what are you talking about? And, um, uh, um, and I think that, you know, we started to get colored coins on board and, um, um, really developing the pro the protocol, but Vitaly kind of like, he was smarter. I think he, you know, he saw all of the, uh, potential and future, uh, problems that Bitcoin is going to have, like in three, four years, um, and, and all of its limitation. And he kind of like said, Okay, I'm going to build my own thing. Uh, but I was, I, I remember that moment when, when, when he said that. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, there is going to be one coin. <laughs> you know, Bitcoin is going to be yeah. the only thing. And we're just going to build on top of that. And we're going to fix the things that are not working and not, you know, scaling. We're going to improve the technology. Um, so we were basically kind of like Chrome. That's well, there's a big difference between, um, you know, continuing to build on one chain versus building on, on other chains. And I have to be honest with you, I don't think it's, you know, down the road that it was a bad idea to experiment with multiple blockchains because how many mistakes have we figured out by some of these chains and coins that have failed over the years? Like, Oh, let's not do this because remember when Namecoin tried this and it didn't work. Or remember when yeah. you know Purecoin tried this and it didn't work. I, I I bet you like a lot of the developers are having these conversations on a day to day basis. So like, you know, do you agree with me on that or do you disagree? No, no, I I, I totally agree. I think that um, you know this is also what gets me like upset, you know, about seeing in the community, um, even, you know, Ethereum, like releasing something or talking about something innovative and, you know, everyone are like, yeah, it's, it's shit coin and all of those things. Like, you know, those people are really innovating and, and there are, there are so many other, um, um, coins and, and, and protocols and projects that are doing some amazing work and it's all good for us. Like, what is the goal? Why did you join? you know, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, is it because of Bitcoin? It's because of the greater idea of changing how finance work. And for me, it's, you know, it's, it's about that. It's about the new type of finance and, and really change how the financial system work. Um, and, and because I was experienced that with my work as a trader in different investment firms, et cetera, I just got discussed from everything and how it works today. So for me, it's, it's all about that. It's not specifically about Bitcoin. 
Very interesting point. Um, I like I like how you kind of frame that, and I like you know what you're saying. Um, essentially, like we have to to expand and to grow and to allow different people to experiment on on different things. And I I think I agree with that. And you know, seems like you you do too. Um, how has the put the progression been? So you go, so you now you go back to the rabbit hole for a second. So you're so you're reading these emails, you're reading the 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 email of your CEO, and um, you're hearing about this Bitcoin thing. Most people um, that were involved in those days, myself included, we were just looking to like play around with this thing and build like fun services on top of Bitcoin, right? We weren't yeah. uh, thinking about what you were thinking about, and and I, I kind of want to like dig deep into your brain and understand why. It's like, it's like I equate it to like in the '90s. You know, talking about the internet, people are talking. Then you'd have you'd come out and say, "Yeah, the internet's going to be cool, but we're going to have artificial intelligence one day." And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? We don't even have DSL. You know, that's kind of like how. Why? What was not? What was wrong? But I mean, yes, when Satoshi had originally wrote the code, he left a little space for metadata, right? Like, so you can yeah. you can start to to. And who knows, maybe that a lot of people are saying that was for video games, for maybe poker. There was because there was poker code in the original Bitcoin code. Do you remember there's a line the, for poker? It's uh, in the op return field. Yeah. What other cool, cool things like that that, you know, people don't really know about? Like, uh, you know, when you're looking at the original Satoshi code, what kind of uh, thoughts would you gather for like how he perceived Bitcoin to be down the road? So so for me, you know, getting into this rabbit hole, um, First, it was, I'm a vision type of guy. Like for me, you know, tell me your vision um, and I will follow. And I think that for me, it was less about the technical parts. It was more about, you know, there is an idea here about looking at things in a different way. And because uh, don't forget that, you know, your background is a little bit different. I came from trading gold and trading um, stocks and all that. So for me, immediately when I looked at that and I read it, I was like, okay, how are we going to use that to um, kind of change the world that I'm living in today? Um, and this is where it wasn't only me. Yeah, it's important to say it was uh, it was also Yoni Asia, many roles yeah. of uh, all the um, um, Alex Mizrahi and then um, who is not Israeli, by the way, Mizrahi, but he's, he's in Ukraine. Um, and Vitalik and, and so many other people, uh, very, very good people. Um, so, so I think that because I came from, from that, uh, background, this is why immediately for me, I try to understand how are we going to build this extra layer to issue a gold asset. And I issued, I issued actually a real gold asset on top of uh, Bitcoin in, in, in the end already of 2012, maybe beginning of 2013. Um, and you know, when Colu even, uh, launched, like we had in 2014, um, um, uh, Intel developing application on top of the platform and Wells Fargo and like all of those big use cases that everyone talking today, they were already on top of, of, of the protocol and the SDK that we developed in 2014, uh, 2015, sorry. So Colu, um, Kolu is very novel and very interesting. And is it something that like someone like me would say, I want to launch like a like a local city card of somewhere where I where I live? Or do you have local like governments that are that are doing it, that are asking you to set it up? Who's using Kolu today? And what kind of like uh reward programs and things like like what is actually going on? Yeah. So I think that um, actually in terms of the entrepreneurial way, I, I think that it's a, it's a very interesting story to learn from uh, Colu. Um, so, um, you know, after being in Cyprus for some time and experienced the financial crisis, people could not withdraw money from their own bank account. It was crazy. I remember the Bitcoin magazine guy guys came to Cyprus to do a video um, about the financial crisis there. Um, so for me, you know, that was really the point where the convergence between everything around Bitcoin and, and what's happening in the real world kind of like hit me. So from a weekend project, it became my passion and everything that I wanted to do. I canceled my application to INSEAD for an MBA, I remember. Yeah, and I got back, you were going to go to school? Yeah, and I, I got back to, um, uh, to Israel and started to understand like, what do I want to do? 
with my life. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something around crypto. Um, so, um, you know, then I kind of like played with the idea of this join my IPO coin power thing that you're on yeah. the video, the animation video. I know. Um, I was just watching it. <laughs> I was just watching yeah. the video just now before we started talking. I remember the, yeah. the video that Aaron did. Guys like yeah. that, Aaron Koning and, and others, they don't get enough credit either because they're the reasons that, you know, without, without cult, people are interested in Bitcoin and crypto, like it's geeky and fun. Don't get me wrong. But it really is the culture and the ideology that that makes people stay and want to like go to conferences and and spend Bitcoin and buy Bitcoin and use it or crypto in general and be part of the community work in the industry. It's yeah. because of all that. So I don't know. I feel like the people that developed the culture, you know, got like what Aaron did basically in Berlin. Uh, he he founded the Bitcoin community of Berlin. I mean, for lack yeah. of a better term, that's what he did. And so um, definitely, guys like him don't get enough credit. I agree. Totally mm. agree. Um, Israel had anyways, one of the first and largest Bitcoin communities too. Yeah, it is. Many um, Rosenfeld. Many, yeah. Also Ron Gross, if you if you met. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, starting, um, then I, I decided to start a call to where uh, the idea was to take in like the protocol and keep developing it, uh, colored coins. Call by the way, is, uh, is a shortcut for colored coins. So, um, uh, we developed a protocol and, um, um, kind of build an SDK on top of that for developers to just play with it. And we said, we'll develop that. We'll start to see what are the use cases that people are building and then we'll see what's happening. So we'll raise money from uh, very good, in, um, VCs, et cetera. And, um, um, we launched, we launched the, uh, the SDK and there was lots of hype. This was basically one of the only places that if you're not a, a very talented Bitcoin developer, you could issue assets. And we had, you know, like Intel, Wells Fargo, um, State Street, like all of the big companies, et cetera, playing with the SDK, developing different uh, PO, POCs, et cetera. Everything looked fine, you know, until we started to encounter problems with Bitcoin in terms of scale, um, uh, you know, transactions. Like th there was a lot of problems with that. And we saw that we have QCs, but nothing really goes into real mainstream use. Um, and one of the use cases that we saw that is kind of um, um, have lots of adoption are community currencies around the world. People just issuing a currency and saying, okay, I want to use that within my community, within my city, et cetera, to impact socially and economically on, on the area. Okay, so let's talk and about hyper-localized token economics. How do you do that? Like, how do you, do you, do you start off and, and create utility first? Like, create a way for people so, to redeem it? Like, walk me through so, that. Yeah, so first I start from then. Call you today doesn't use blockchain at all. Okay. okay? Um, um, and then I'll go backwards. So um, we started giving people access to issue those coins. We built them a wallet, everything that they need in order to do that. Um, and then, you know, so many problems that we, we encountered, you know, with mainstream adoption. So we said, okay, we're going to do it. So we started the community in Tel Aviv, which grew to, grew very fast to 100,000 people, um, using the coin in, in merchants. So I would earn that. I will earn the coin, um, or buy the coin with a credit card and I will use it in local shops. So we had like already, I think 500 shops that you could spend that local coin and it kind of was keep circulating within the local economy. Hmm. But then, you know, there were other problems with regulations and all of that. Um, and we decided, and then started, I think all of the ICO craze. And we had like a crazy idea about creating something in terms of, um, um, a network. Um, uh, we called it CLN. Anyway, in the end, uh, we raised like $35 million, I think, and we gave all the money back um, to the investors. Um, and today, basically, uh, we work with Color Works with cities. Um, so we sell the platform to cities. For example, Akron, Ohio is the last uh, city that we um, announced. And we're going to uh, start working with another uh, five cities. Uh, I want to do this year. in my city. It's so cool. We will. So basically, the city encouraged different behaviors that it wants to encourage. 
and people get those rewards and they can spend it only in local shops. So it's kind of like solves the city problem in terms of engagement. So if you if the city wants to make you recycle more, it wants to get you to drive more public transportation, more, volunteer more. So it's it's kind of a, re, a reward program. Um, so this, the company basically now expand in, in, in the US, but kept the whole crypto um, uh, behind it. I believe that one day it will get back on top of that, but we just need much more clarity and 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 the technology together, basically. Interesting. So you think you think that um, you'll eventually go back to to issuing these these on the blockchain? I think that once there will be a network of you know tens or hundreds of, of cities, it will be interesting to to put that on the blockchain and connect them in some way. So yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and so, but but going back, so going back to that, like if you, so going back to like creating, uh, so Akron, uh, Ohio comes to you and they want to do something like this. What's the process? Um, so we're uh, we're basically you know sending them um, an offer. The city uh, sometimes needs to do because it's political, so they need to do some kind of a tender. Um, so the city basically taking over that and they're bringing merchants on board into the app and users and they add goals, which looks like stories in the app. Um, so the city could say, uh, go and shop in that specific area and get 20% cash back in the local coin, local coin. And then people will go and shop there and they will get, uh, automatically, um, the rewards or for example, go and drive public transportation or go and recycling any trigger event that happens in the real world people are getting rewarded with the city coin and then they can go use it and spend it only in local shops but how do you where how is the value created i guess um the value I, so is, is the dollar is just um equals to dollars in the beginning someone's losing money right because in the beginning you're taking this the city coin or the city card and then you have to you be able to redeem it for something to, in order to people to use it uh, so oh, someone somewhere in the beginning is is losing out this, no so the city basically funds the reward okay, so, so for the city, the, city it's, the city is very simple for them because today they're putting so much money out of taxpayers just to um, you know put a billboard or um, yeah. something on Facebook that someone clicked but they don't know what happened with that budget? Like people are really engaged. They, they've done what I want them to do. Um, and with that platform, basically, you're starting from the end of the process. People first doing what the city wants them to do, if it's to go and shop local or to drive public transportation. And only then the money goes out in terms of the marketing budget. So, so is this for almost the city, like, it's a new way. So it's almost like the way I perceive it is like a city is paying to launch their own currency, right? Your quotes. Eventually, you know, you create the utility on day one, you create, and because it's not on a blockchain, you can like do whatever you want with it and scale it. And you could, you can, um, almost not really worry about selling and buying pressure. And then once you have a robust ecosystem, then you, you, do you potentially put it on a blockchain or, or is anyone asking you about that? So, you know, cities are excited about blockchain, but afraid about blockchain. It's like, yeah, I don't this, blame is, this is what we had, right? So. So yeah. I think that, you know, in a year or two, we might be able to start talking about it. Uh, we have kind of like a Trojan horse that I hope that cities are not going to listen to the, uh, to the podcast, but, uh, um, um no. some, <laughs> of <the> city, <laughs> some of the city will, will launching a city card and the city card basically is a private key. They don't That's know. That's so that. cool. Okay. So, um, this is kind of like a Trojan horse that once, um, it gets bigger, we'll be able to just you know, um, everyone have a private key and, uh, we can just start and play with it. Oh, so you're saying that, that that's, oh, that's so cool. So you're not that you're getting it in. You're going to launch these city cards and they're going to have private keys built into it. So they're not, they're just not going to be like enabled in the beginning, I guess. Yeah. yeah they, they don't know that it's there. It's just a city card that I identifier, but it has on the chip on the EVM chip. They have, the, it's got like it's private key. So we can then play with it afterwards, like let's say in the future, if you want to um, start putting assets on top of that or sync that together with the app, etc., uh, we can do that. So this is kind of like a Trojan horse to please first spread and then um, we'll see what's going on uh, in the future. But Kolu is very successful. It's got like um, 
um, hundreds of thousands of users and um, uh, many cities basically paying um, a, sub a yearly subscription fee to, to run the program. Okay, come on. This is so cool. This is the new BitPay card that I have in my hand, and I'm so excited to be finally having the new one that just came out. Now, guys, I've been using the BitPay card since 2016. Yeah, you heard that right. Way before I started Untold Stories, way before Bit BitPay became a sponsor of mine, I've been using this card, and it literally became a way for me to have a bank account uh, for many, many years, as, as a lot of people in crypto need banking, need better banking. The BitPay card is chock full of the coolest features. It's got contactless pay, uh, better rates and limits, no fees to convert from Bitcoin right onto the card, added in chip security. I mean, it's sexy. It looks good, unlike other cards. It's so easy to get. Just download the BitPay app on your phone, click the card icon, and you can do it right there. If you use the promo code CharlieJune20, your card is free. Remember, CharlieJune20. 20. It's in the show notes. You can get a free card. So literally, just from listening to my show today, and make sure you actually listen, you can get a free card just by entering that code. So download the BitPay app, get the coolest card on the market, the best card on the market. I've been using it for over four years now. I know there are so many cards out there, but the BitPay brand is the oldest and longest running Bitcoin company in the world. I mean, that's who issues this card. This is the card you want to have. Remember, Charlie, June 20, download the BitPay app on iOS or Android to sign up for the new card. You're going to freaking love it. This is almost mind blowing because uh, most people don't know this is going on. How many of these city cards do you think you, you'll print and you'll have them out? Uh, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of them. You have hundreds um, of thousands of people holding private keys without them even knowing. <laughs> yeah, they don't need to know right now. You know, That's I think crazy. That, you know, that that crypto will be successful, you know, once people will not know that they're using crypto. So I think yeah. that, you know, that, that this is what we're trying to do. And um, But how um, would that affect, you come from a trading background, right? Let, let's talk about this for a second. Yeah, let's look at yeah. the, the numbers from last, and I never like to talk about pricing, but um, I want to pick your brain. In 2017, the ICO bubble pushed the price of Ethereum up a lot. Now with Now with DeFi and with what's going on, you're not seeing the Ethereum price really move, but you're seeing craziness go on with all these like, you know, distributed finance tokens and blah, blah, blah. Why is that? Why isn't uh, Ethereum going up? And not specifically Ethereum, but the question is, you know, further, if we gauge success by everyone, you know, we're using crypto, but no one really knows we're using it, you know, the whole world, will that basically mean that the Bitcoin price will just stay the same it is now? Or will there be a reason to own like Bitcoin and things yeah. or Ethereum or whatever down the road? So that, that's really funny because I, I thought about it actually last week. Um, and I tried to analyze that in terms of uh, in, in the trader's eyes. I have also um, uh, one of the companies that I founded um, even before Koli is an algo trading company. Um, it's a very successful algo trading company uh, managing hundreds of millions now. Um, so, um, I think that, um, um, in terms of, you know, how you look at the demand compared to ICO and DeFi, I think that, you know, when you look at the ICO bubble, um, you needed the, the people who were participating in those ICOs. And I'm, if you remember those days, it's around 20 ICOs a day, something like that. I remember people looking at the schedule to see if there ever slot in a specific day in terms of an ICO. So, the number of ICOs and the amount of ether that people needed in order to participate in that craze created a crazy demand for ether. Okay. With DeFi, it's a more gradual, um, uh, demand. So okay. I think that this one is a much more healthier, uh, growth, um, to, to, to Ethereum than what it had in, in, in ICO. It does create um, some because some of the application that you do need, you know, to buy ether, pay gas, all of that. But it's not even close to the amount of demand for ether that was in in, in the times of ICO. I mean, that was crazy because you needed ether in order to participate in yeah. the token sale. Yeah, yeah. So, so the amount I, I kind of like looked at that. I, I think it's um, you know it's uh, it's hundreds times more than what you have today with DeFi, which is. And healthy demand, it's, it's for gas and, yeah. and fees, et cetera. 
How does how would someone you know if I look at you like a token economist? How would someone launch a token like in terms of uh, on economies of scale? Uh, do you focus on like creating a utility first? Do you focus on creating a when I mean utility like for example you could redeem the token for like thirty percent off at a restaurant or you know stuff yeah. like that or or do you create the ability for people to buy that token or sell it first? I mean it's a chicken and the egg problem in your experience. What's kind of like the best way to go about it? Maybe we'll launch some coins. That's that's really interesting because you know you have those um, um, those use cases of um, of of networks where there is no utility and the hype is so high and the community is so strong that um, you know the price and the value is so high. And on the other side, okay, you have um, networks where there is a lot of real use cases in the real world, connected to the real world, and there is almost, you know, no one watching, and 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 the price does not reflect the hype. I'll give you one yeah. example to that type of. Uh, so, for example, Algorand. Okay, so Algorand. Oh, that's a good example, is, actually. Yeah, so Algorand is. Um, um, and Algorand is a very interesting example because, you know, the technology is really novel and um, what they're doing is super innovative. There, there is a lot of criticism about decentralization there, etc. A lot of things that the foundation and, and the company are really dealing with it and dealing with it pretty good. Um, but look at the real use cases that they're launching right now. Um, the partnership that they're assigning, et cetera. Those are like real life use cases and, and something you don't see it reflected in, in the price. So I would definitely, you know, looking, I'm, I'm definitely looking into those opportunities when I'm looking at trading. Yeah. Um, and, um, so some things are like, you know, projects that I'm looking at. So Algorand is like one of the interesting, another project that I'm, by the way, very, very excited about is Horizon. Did you know Horizon? Yeah, I had the CEO of Horizon here, Rob. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. He was on the so show. Rob, we released the episode. Horizon's so cool, actually. What I love about doing this show is that the they'll continue to follow up. So Horizon made an announcement last week. Rob sent me an email and he's like, you're just following up. So it's kind of cool to, to, to have those relationships yeah. now. They are, by the way, one of the teams that I'm. Um, I'm just uh, thrilled to work with, uh, I, um, because they're um, they are like the the old crypto punks. It's it's the real thing. They're they're executing heads down, no noise, yeah. full, full transparency. You know, they, every week they just uh, announced they they put Zendu on Testnet, which was a big yeah, deal. Which, which is, by the way, like the first um, decentralized uh, sidechain. Yeah, sidechain. Yeah, it, it, real decentralized. You know, I got into I I kind of like got into the depths of it. So um, so those are like very very exciting projects, and this is why you know when people are looking only at Bitcoin. Although I'm a Bitcoin, you know, it's like yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, um, there are lots of exciting uh, projects uh, for people to to look at. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's it. But I don't you know how we me... got to talk about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, uh, they're in. Well, they're in. Um, they're in Austin, and I kind of want to. Austin's always been. So you know this. Austin has always been yeah. where, like, the early crypto world, the early Bitcoin crypto world, got founded. So you have David Johnson, who I also had on the show. Yeah. And. Yeah. Um, based in Austin, and he was one of the the he was wasn't he involved in colored coins early on, or it was like Dave, what's the David Jensen was um, uh, he started the Mastercoin, Mastercoin, uh, Bit Angels, and Factum. But what was the relationship yeah. with the Mastercoin? Colored coins was originally wasn't colored coins originally so, counterparty Mastercoin? No, so, so colored coins was actually the first uh, protocol, and then Mastercoin basically used kind of like the same idea. And they created a currency for that. But basically, you didn't need another currency. And this was always my problem. Like, uh, we said, like, okay, you can do everything that you can do with MasterCoin, but you don't need MasterCoin. You can just use Bitcoin, right? Um, that's what so, the, that's what it was. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I, I didn't, you know, they raised $1 million. I remember, you know. It huge was amount of money back then. Yeah, huge amount of money. Um um, so, um, so, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, for us, it was, um, looking at that and we're saying, okay, but why do I need the master coin? Like I can use Bitcoin and use colored coins. This is why we kept on developing that. And this was the same thing with counterparty, by the way. 
if you remember. I never understood why um, things like Master Coin Counterparty, uh, Colored Coins, you know, the, the, the pre, you know, I kind of like focus on, you have like the pre-Ethereum altcoins as I, you know, because yeah. once Ethereum came, the altcoin was like almost mainstreamed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, a lot of the early coins were very experimental. And I guess the difference was because there wasn't a lot of money involved, there wasn't, there wasn't really like, no one was doing it for scamming or fraud purposes because there wasn't really any money involved in this. Like nothing was worth yeah. anything. You look at like yeah. the market caps of like the top 10 coins back in 2013, it probably didn't, didn't exceed a million dollars total. Like it's just, yeah. and all those coins don't exist anymore either. It's kind of funny. I mean, how do you feel that you're, you're probably, I mean, like a year or two now, you're going to be like in this industry in a, for a decade. Like, how does that feel? Um, <laughs> I, I actually, oh, yeah, um, I actually took a very long break um, out of the community. No, it doesn't um, count though. Once you're in, you're in. No, I, I, I took like actually, you know, two years. I I was invited to conferences, all, all of that. I just took time off. I didn't do anything, didn't talk to anyone. I think it was uh, 2017, 2018. It's a very Israeli thing to do, by the way. <laughs> really? <laughs> you no, know, I'm just joking. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, but I think, you know, looking at the past, I think we made like a very big mistake and the biggest mistake was that we saw the limitation of Bitcoin and we had those crazy ideas about developing, um, you know, a blockchain, I guess, like Tesla or something like that. Yeah. Um, back in 2014, I remember, you know, Everyone were telling us like, no, um, uh, Blockstream are going to solve all the Bitcoin problems. Like, keep developing on top of Bitcoin. And and what we actually had needed to do back then, as Kolu, by the way, was to just drop out of uh, Bitcoin and develop a new blockchain with all of the dreams that we had back then, which were everything that you're seeing ba basically today. Um, so I think that looking back for me, the one thing I'm happy about being in the space for a long time, like the one miss that I'm looking at is like, it's, it's that, that we could be, you know, like two or after, you know, with Ethereum, same market cap, same size, etc. Um, do you think that narrative has almost shifted to where it's like people were almost trying to unseat Bitcoin in the early, like the flippening, like the 2000 16 to 2000, 2015 to 2018 or 19, or it's still now going on, especially 2019, it was going on, but like the whole like Ethereum is going to flip Bitcoin. Now I'm like seeing different narratives. If you you go, go to an, a Coindesk article about a company that raised money for here or whatever, it's more of like unseating Ethereum. It's like they want to go after Ethereum's market share. Yeah. They want to go after Ethereum's. Because yeah, it's like I mean, Bitcoin's because, almost like yeah, it's, it's great totally at what it does. Game. Let's yeah. This is why I always you know people saying yeah Bitcoin yeah, but it's doing what it is. It's it's like you know people are acting it as a store of value as something that they want to hold, and it's good. It's good for that. Just leave it alone. Yeah, like, just leave it alone. Um, I always use the bagel uh, analogy. It's like if you buy a bagel, you don't have enough cream cheese, you can't spread it around. You want to do <laughs> one thing right instead of doing yeah. a lot of things mediocre. Exactly. Exactly that. Um, and I think that, by the way, when I'm, I'm talking with, and I'm helping a lot of, I'm, I'm behind the scenes in a lot of projects and I'm helping a lot of founders, et cetera, to, to kind of like share my experience, you know, bad thing, good things that I've done in the past, um, seeing all of those use cases, et cetera. And one thing that I see all the time is that they want to, to have a blockchain for all of the use cases. And I'm saying like, no, like choose one thing that, that, you know, it's good for, like, what is the use case? Y you want to be good in something specific, like the people are thinking, okay, I want to build that use case. This is the right place to do that. Um, and I think, um, you know, this is something that you see a lot in, in all the founders of blockchain projects. They want to be the decentralized for everything. Right. Does that, is that the best thing? Like de the whole decentralize all the things, you know, that your refrigerator, it when, it seems to me that talking to you, you understand that everything is a balance. So what is the balance of the internet of things? Or what is the balance of like decentralization? Where is decentralization good? But I guess in some other places, 
you know, a decentralized currency or a blockchain, it just doesn't make sense. So it's like, why waste the time? Do you agree yeah. that there needs to be a balance? Yeah, Some people are yeah. like all blockchain, a lot of people are like all non, but it seems to be there needs to be like a, like a balance. Uh, where are we in there that? We, inf- are we in that infrastructure stage? You think? I think that um, um, I kind of like sometimes agree with those people and sometimes not, because a lot of the use cases, a lot of the things that people are building, it's really there is you know you remember that time of um, um, private blockchains. It was a yeah. period of time. I think it was 2017 or 18 was no 17 was the year of private blockchain, and everyone were talking about private blockchain. And, um, um, and I think, you know, this is, and, and we see where it goes basically kind of fail because you understand that with a database, you can do much better thing at, at, at last cost, right? So, yeah. so this is, you know, people already realize that most of the company went to that, um, uh, area kind of like bankrupt or not existing anymore. Do you remember, for example, one of the great companies in the space back then were chain.com. Oh yeah, whatever happened to chain.com? Right. So so Oh my god, I chain haven't heard was, that name in so long. So chain were, you know, they were amazing. I think they were one of the best teams in in the space mm-hmm. back then. They had like mm-hmm. the best UI. Um they I need to Google were, this. You know, yeah, so so what happened? I I think that they went to um private blockchains, got the investment from Visa and all that and um um uh super smart people. Um, they want a different angle. Then, yeah, and then I, I think they sold to a Stellar um, or something like that. Uh, but what I'm saying is that, you know, there was a time that pe- all the people went to the centralized uh, part. And um, uh, today, I think uh, we're kind of exactly in the middle, uh, which yeah. is good. Um, you see things that are like, um, take some of the advantages of decentralization. but Oh, Stellar bought Chain.com. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Jed, Jed bought it. I should have asked him about it last week. I had him <laughs> on the show too. Yeah. Um, yeah. He visited our offices in Tel Aviv. I remember um, two years ago or something. I kind of want to uh, buy chain.com, just like the dot com name. I just like yeah, the, yeah. the name. <laughs> I just want to buy yeah. the domain name. <laughs> ask him what's the price. I will. No, I just, I'm going to ask him right now. Oh, and that's I so have- funny. And I have the um, uh, BitcoinX.org uh, domain, um, which I love. Um, and during the time of the forks on Bitcoin, someone offered, I think, um, eighty thousand dollars on that domain. Oh wow! And I couldn't say. I had Bitcoin.vc. Ah. Or bitcoins. Ah. I sold it for two Bitcoin to someone. <laughs> but that was when? on Bitcoin. It was only worth like a thousand dollars. I needed the uh, money though when I got out of jail. Yeah, can imagine. When I got out of jail, I just sold assets for Bitcoin. And then I was lucky that that I just sold everything I had for Bitcoin. I would sell, people would buy t-shirts signed by me for like half a Bitcoin, but Bitcoin was only worth $200 back then. So I just started selling all this shit and just getting Bitcoin. Like when I first got out of jail and the next thing I know, Bitcoin goes from 200 to 20,000. That's literally wow. what I did. It's so funny. Not yeah, funny, but that's, it's... That's some- that, that's um, great. Yeah. I, I actually, I remember when, you know, it kind of like disappeared. Uh, we were like talking and all that. Uh, like, what the fuck is going on? And yeah. uh, it was first crazy time. <laughs> like, what happened to him? And, you know, now, now me, you know, understanding a lot about regulations and um, all that. It's like, this is, uh, yeah, crazy shit. There's a... Um, it's interesting you, you bring that up. There's a, a, a company that I, that, that's actually based out of Israel that I like that has a good team. Um, and there are many, you know, uh, Saga, Saga. Yeah. So yeah. I like, I like Saga. Like I like Edo a lot and I think the model is very novel and, um, they went very deep into the rabbit hole of token economics and they're, you know, building out a decentralized central bank. It's like, Hey, yeah. central banks are not bad ideas. They're run badly nowadays, but what if we had the ability to do it like a hybrid central bank? So you think we'll see more of these type of projects that are still experimenting with different ways to do like open or decentralized finance? Yeah, definitely. Actually with central banks, one of the companies who invested in Kalu um, is the company who's printing all of the physical cash in the world for all of the central banks. Oh, I know this company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a British company, right? Or something? I don't know. I, I can't. I can't say the the name. Whatever. Or it doesn't anything. matter. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so anyway, so I had, you know, meetings with maybe all of the central banks in the world in uh, uh, 2016, 2017. Um, and um, the problem for me was, and why it didn't work for us to work with central bank back then, it's because they always wanted to do centralized stuff. And then I went back and said like, okay, so take a database. So I think that, you know, the solution about decentralization of our fiat money is not going to come from central banks. Um, because they, they can't have, they want to have control. So they, I don't see them using something yeah. like Saga, right? Well, the, the, the whole idea is like creating an, a, an alternative, like whole currency network, you know, that's, ah. it's very yeah, bold and it's crazy and it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, it's just yeah, a lot yeah. of work. No, the, this is exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying like, this is what, what I think will work. Like uh, doing something with central bank, um, could be innovative, but you know, I, specifically for me, it was a little bit boring. Like it, I signed up to change how finance works and not do yeah. it the way that the central banks want to do. Right? That's so a good like, point. So, what's next for you? What is the um, the ah, this a Bitcoin? Um, I oh, my lamp. Nice. Yeah, your lamp. Nice. Thank I you. Love it. I keep it on. I keep it on green. Uh, nice. When I talk to Bitcoin Cash people, <laughs> and I keep it on. No, I don't. I don't talk to Bitcoin. I'm just joking. I make that joke every time someone comments. I need to come up with a better yeah. joke. So for me, you know, firstly, Colu is, is becoming very successful. I'm I actually like my moving. Life. I'm moving to Barcelona, which is oh, very congratulations. Cool. Thank you. You started um, a fund, right? Um, I'm doing a lot of things. So I started investing in um, different uh, startups, um, helping different different uh, projects like Ryzen and, and some others in the space. Um, um, got my brother into crypto. He's a very successful entrepreneur, uh, already exited like two uh, startups. And uh, I got him into Bitcoin finally and crypto. So he's developing... Took long enough. Uh, yeah, so he's developing a game, uh, which um, it calls House of Crypto where each house is um, uh, blockchain, basically, and it's got its own avatars and magics, and it's an education platform. So through the avatars and magics where uh, houses are fighting against each other, people learn about the specific blockchain and its capabilities. Oh, that's so cool. Education uh, through through entertainment, kind of like this yeah, show, yeah. And, and you have, um, and you have um, a weekly pool for each one of the houses. So depending on your score, you're getting real crypto from the house that you're playing for. And already um, like five foundations uh, joined that game, which is uh, very exciting. Um, I'm happy I had like a good start with crypto. So yeah. the, the foundations basically fund the reward because they're getting the, uh, you know, the people in the community playing for that. So that's very, very cool. Um, and then you know I I uh, I keep investing in the in the space and for me both blockchain Bitcoin specifically basically changed my life forever yeah so um, so I will keep being involved in everything that I can do to help and I do a lot of things just for the sake of advancing the technology I guess what do you what do you do for fun I surf um, spend time with the family I have two kids. Do you live near the beach? Uh, um, my house is just in front of the beach, yeah. Oh, so, beautiful. Me too. Yeah, it's over there. It's the beautiful beach. I'm at my office now, downtown. It's really nice, I think. Do you think, do you think, um, you know, it's interesting. Can I ask you a question not related to crypto? Uh, yeah. A lot of people are talking about in, in America now, you'll see like a huge migration, the great migration. People in New York are going to move to Florida. People in Colorado, you know, Oregon are going to move south. You're just going to see like people all over the world uh, say like, we, you know, why am I living in a place that has like high taxes and high low quality of life when I don't need to work in an office anymore? Like the, the whole working now is the whole, the whole uh, world now is reinventing how we work. So even if only 20% of people say I'm going to move, um, that'll be a huge effect in the U S you think something like that could happen in Israel? So it, it, Israel's a little bit different. Like you can't go anywhere. You can't drive anywhere outside. I was talking to yeah. actually someone. Have you been there? My, Have you been here before? So I actually grew up. My my parents tried to make Aliyah when I was young. And uh, we. No I, kidding. Yeah, I moved to Kiryat Ono for a few years and I went to school. <laughs> and then 
um, uh, Nolality be, be Brooklyn, the Halakhti Yeshiva. You know, you, know, you know, I did it. I didn't know that. You didn't know that. I, I didn't know that. No. My my school Crazy. was Ivrit be Ivrit. So I learned math in Hebrew. I learned English in Hebrew. So even though I'm born in Brooklyn, <laughs> English isn't my first language because I learned. I grew up speaking Hebrew. Uh, it's weird. I, People don't realize. Like yeah. I'll say, like, can you close the light? And my wife is like, what do you? How do you close a light? I'm like, it's just a, <laughs> the Hebrew word for close is same for turn off. It's like or I'm like walking on the yeah. ground instead of walking on the floor. <laughs> uh, but do you think in Israel uh, you'll see like a migration because? Tel Aviv is so expensive, but that's where you have to live to work. But with remote yeah. work, I mean, you can get a beautiful home, you know, in the north of the country. You can get a beautiful home down to, you know, on the outskirts of a lot now, aren't they building or like near the Dead Sea? Like all these communities. And do you see uh, you'll see like like a nice uh, already like Israel has conquered the negative, you know, do you see a further of that? I'm just curious, you know. Yeah, I, I think we'll see two things. So first, we're already seeing what you're talking about, because. You know, um, Kolu as well, for example, um, started work remotely, totally. Like, we don't know if we're going to keep the off. So it's like, we're, we're totally remote. And, and you start in hearing those voices of, you yeah. know, I might move there, I might move there. It doesn't really matter. And even for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm moving to Barcelona because my wife wants to do the PhD there. Um, but, um, but I couldn't even think about doing that before the corona. I was supposed so, to be in Barcelona right now, actually, for a wedding. It's funny that you say that. I was supposed really? to fly yesterday. Are there any flights? No, no. The wedding was was moved to next year. Same date yeah. next year. So I'll see you next year. Yeah, that's good. Don't forget to call me. No, no, I won't. Um, so, so you're sorry. I interrupted you. So you're, so you're, yeah, so you're moving no, to Barcelona, so, so, and you so, can still do what you're doing there. Exactly. So I can do because it doesn't matter. We're working from home anyway. And and you're starting to see that. Like I have like two employees that are going to move outside of the center of uh, Israel to, like you said, the north or um, the Negev. Um, so, yeah, of course, like they can save much more money. They can live a better life. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a totally new world. Um, totally new world. Crazy, crazy, crazy world we live in. And I think it's going to be really great. I hope to see you next year in Spain. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. And what what insights I got today and everyone <laughs> did. I want to release this very quickly. <laughs> All right, Thank man. you, Amos. Thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you.